Welcome to the Inspiring Tech Leaders podcast with me, Dave Roberts. This week, my special guest is Danny Asias. Danny is the Chief Digital and Information Officer at Anthony Nolan. He has also held positions with the Grassroots Group, Marks and Spencer, John Lewis, and Kodak. Danny was named as the top UK CIO in the 2020 CIO 100. He is a delivery-driven technology leader who is passionate about using digital transformation to enable organizations to achieve their strategic objectives. Danny is also a member of the Women in Technology Mentoring Program and an advisory board member for the HMG UK CIO Leadership Summit. Welcome to the podcast, Danny. It's great to have you here today. Thank you very much, Dave. I've never been introduced by the Hollywood voiceover guy before, so <laughs> this is a great honour. <laughs> so, uh, so to give the listeners a little bit of a, um, a, a background to you and, and your work at Anthony Nolan, can you perhaps just, you know, just describe some of the journey you've been on, that, that transformational journey you, you, you've, you've, you've taken Anthony Nolan through and really what Anthony Nolan actually does? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we've got to start. We've got to start with what we do. That's the most important thing, and it's saving the lives of people with blood cancer. It's as simple as that. Um, not a simple thing to do, but but the mission is is simple to explain. We're, we're the UK's uh, national stem cell register. In fact, we were the world's first stem cell register over forty years ago. And what that means is individuals out there who are prepared to provide us with a small bit of DNA, uh, blood or saliva, cheek swab, uh, to join a, a DNA register on the off chance that someone in the world who needs a life-saving stem cell transplant um, might be a match with them. Uh, and you know, the chances of being matched are, are really small. It's a very unique thing here. Um, and, and that's what we are. So we, we, have, uh, we have nearly a million people on our register, but globally there are over 40 million people uh, on various registers around the world. And uh, it means that anyone on, anyone on the planet that needs a life-saving transplant that doesn't have a family member who is a, a perfect match for them, they come to Anti Nolan or they come to any other register around the world. And we all collaborate with each other to try and find the best possible match. That's what we do, it's kind of plain and simple in a nutshell. Anti Nolan are reasonably complex. Um, I won't spend too long on this, but we also run our own DNA laboratories. Uh, we have our own research facility, our own patient services, our own umbilical cord blood collection facility, uh, as well as the laboratories and storage associated with it. So we're a we're kind of massively complex organization for our relative size, which is around 350 people. That's and in that, terms yeah. of, I was just going to say, so moving on to the second part of your question, in, in terms of transformation, mm. um, we have historically invested very heavily in science, in, in, uh, tech, in uh, laboratory equipment, uh, and in uh, anything to do with the patient. But historically, we hadn't really invested particularly much on technology because as, as an organization, we hadn't made the association between technology and, and life saving. And that changed around five years ago um, when I joined as a, the first CIO reporting straight into the CEO and, and on the board. And uh, we really kickstarted that journey of, of transformation of just really updating all of our core platforms, all of our systems organizing all of our data and and also putting a kind of digital front end to all of that because you're achieving a lot with a, a relatively small team in the grand scheme of things and i think that that's what's yeah everyone's probably been most impressed about is, is the the ability to um make make so much change so much so much transformation within the business within within that team so what, what you know, remind the audience again of, you know what, what sort of size team you know do you look after so our internal team has grown massively to just 25 people. And that includes service desk, hosting, business analysts, product owners, uh, application developers, front end, back end, application support, the works, the whole information, you know, the whole gamut. And um, interesting, I uh, just having a, a call this morning with someone new uh, in the team. And I said to them, imagine we had a team of 300 people that's how we need to behave. We need to be organized, prioritized, structured, not just do everything on a whim. Oh, well, some, so-and-so asked for that, so I'm going to go and get the developer to make a change for them. We've got to organize ourselves. We spoke with some partners recently who had a look at our estate, and I said to them, look, we're not doing that much development, are we? It's not that complex. And they said, actually, 
you have a significant number of very complex products that you're developing yourselves internally. Um, don't do yourselves a disservice. So yeah, we, we just have to make it work with the resources that we have available and using the uh, the tools at our disposal. And a lot of those tools are cultural. They're about training, they're about intention, they're about how we're organized and how we're motivated. So do you find it a challenge though in these, you know, with COVID-19, the environment that we're having to live in at the moment, when you're, you know, you, you continue to grow your team now and, you know, do you find that, to, to, you know, finding the right um, tech talent, is, is that a challenge for, for you? No, less so, to be honest. Um, there is, there is more, we're getting much better response uh, to roles, uh, direct advertising roles since uh, the start of the pandemic. Um, we have recruited people regardless of where they physically located in the UK. The guy I was speaking to this morning lives a couple of hundred miles away from our office. Um, and it just, it just wasn't an issue. It's not something we've worried about. If anything, it's given us a boost to recruitment um, and really driving that um, flexible working agenda as well. And, and also, you know, just scheduling interviews and not having to worry about availability and time in meeting rooms. We just, we have an unlimited number of meeting rooms in uh, in Microsoft Teams. So it's, uh, it, it actually has made life a little bit easier. The, uh, the flip side, I'll challenge myself on that. Every company on the planet is now obsessed with digital transformation. And so starting to recruit uh, um, experienced tech talent certainly becomes a little bit more difficult. We've been recently looking for a tech lead and that's proving very difficult. Um, but but it's been it's been fine for business analysts and, and various other roles. So is your, is your team uh, distributed across the, the entire of the UK then? Um, we're not really. I mean, we're historically um, uh, London centric up until last year, and uh, we've now recruited um, a couple of people who don't live who don't live locally, and then we've got others who are thinking about moving, um, and we've got some who live kind of close enough to come to the office but actually far enough that it costs them a lot of time and money to come into the office and, and really don't want to be doing that every day so mm. we we actually took a decision pretty much in the first month of lockdown to give up our uh, and when i say our i mean the it office in our uh, estate we gave that up and and um exited the lease on it but i gave everyone in the team an option to say you know, would you be prepared to give up your desk provided you can decide where you work from and you can come in and hot desk whenever you want? And they all said yes. Uh, so we just gave up the physical, the, the office space completely. But I think we're, we're also seeing you know, new, new ways of working and that the different use of office space going forward you know, in a post-COVID world will be, will be very different. You know, I, I just think of my, my own experiences of probably spending you know, 10 hours uh, each week you know, commuting backwards and forwards uh, from, from a work location, whereas now that, you know, that, that, that uh, time um, you know, it can be put back into uh, more productive uh, activities. And, uh, well, to be honest, I mean, we're, we're, um, we're really excited about this. We are, I am being a very strict nine to five. Uh, I looked at my, my analytics on Microsoft.com uh, in the first few months of pandemic and I was, <laughs> I was doing 13 plus hour days, you know, 6 a.m. until late at night. And I just thought, this is fun, but it's not sustainable. Um, and we are all being really quite rigorous about logging off at five o'clock um, and, and really not logging on too early, unless people want to log on early and they, they get their best thinking time there. But we're genuinely excited about the future of work and the future of office. And we don't know what it looks like, but what's exciting is the ability to apply some real agile principles in that approach of really figuring out what we want and uh, coming up with loads of ideas and running lots of experimentation. So whether it's a, an Apple style genius bar for our service desk in, in the main office so that people can just go up and, and uh, get, their, get their laptops repaired or get equipment handed out or ask a question to creating library spaces, collaboration spaces. Um, we've got the opportunity to put some objectives, get some metrics in place and just run some experiments, really use the beauty of this the, the next uh, 12, 18 months to experiment with lots of different opportunities and see see what works and what doesn't, rather than trying to predict what it should look like and then build it as a, as a waterfall approach. 
So what, what are those you know, strategic objectives that you've got or those, those aims and goals that you've got for the next, uh, the next year? Um, uh, in terms of future work or... or um, well, just generally what's on the, also on the, t- the tech agenda. So, yeah, for the tech agenda, I mean, the, we, we're just in the process of, of closing out a, a huge uh, transformation project, which is around supporter engagement. It replaces our fundraising and marketing CRM, our direct marketing tools, um, the consolidation and clen- cleansing of all of our data and, and the integration of our, um, our kind of marketing platform and our donor transplantation platform so that if... If you're a donor who is also interested in running the London Marathon for us, we can join the two records together, and we can we can talk uh, we can talk to you as a whole rather than as a, a component. But in terms of the the future, we are g- genuinely excited about a, a, a project which is going to bring most of our back end services, the services that we provide hospitals and transplant centres around the world, some digital platforms. So to date those guys have been serviced predominantly through phone, email, and fax. Uh, Internally, we've got brilliant systems to to manage all of our workflows, but the actual interaction with the customer has been very old fashioned. And we focus a lot of our digital work on engaging with donors and with supporters. Uh, So this is our opportunity now to start to scale up and build up um, digital platforms to uh, enable our work with transfer centers and, and to boil it down what we're trying to do is create operational efficiencies in order to reduce the time it takes to get cells for a transplant, which increases the likelihood of survival. That's it. That's that's the objective. Um, and uh, we, we're going to kick that off just after the summer. And uh, we, we, I know I've said it three times already. We are genuinely excited uh, about, about uh, doing this work with all of the transplant centres across the UK and globally. How do you manage to balance those uh, innovation projects and the new ideas coming through while also trying to maintain the, you know, the business as usual, um, you know, op- operational work as well? Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you get the balance between the two? We, we, um, we have a little bit of legacy left and we're, we're just in the process of, of um, eliminating that. Every platform that we build is a living, breathing, evergreen thing. And um, we have a product owner aligned to each each of our internal products, um, and it is it is continuously improved. So we align. It's a small amount of resource. You know, it might be might be a product owner, a business analyst, and a couple of developers. It won't be huge, but it means that on a on a fortnightly cycle, we're continuously making improvements to every single platform, such that at any given point in time, that f- platform is up to date, it's relevant uh, and it's delivering. It's never sliding backwards and getting old. And then when we do a project like this, we try and do a bit of fundraising. Um, we uh, you know, we try and get the funding ready for it and, and use partners where we can use partners. But we, we need to kind of silo them to a certain degree. So we, we have maybe about four or five product products being constantly developed all at the same time in a team of around 25 people. So it sounds insane when I say it out loud. Um, but we, we just, you know, we just, we, we make small incremental gains every fortnight uh, and you just keep doing that rather than putting 20 people on a project and doing a great big project, but then everything else is a distraction and a drain on you. So do you have sort of feature squads or, you know, thinking about working, you talk about two week cycles, so you're working in two week sprint cycles of, of, uh, of, of developments and things like that. But do you, do you have different feature squads that are focused on different elements of, of, the, of their overall program? No, not so much because the, um, we, we do work on that kind of agile scrum two week principle. Um, but the, if, if you think about our laboratory system as an example, which is all the DNA coming through and the, and the typing and the testing, you know, there'll, be, there'll be one product owner there. There might be about three or four uh, developers. And then the customer base is internal. And that customer base is maybe about 20 people. So it's, it's quite small. It's, it's very, it's, it's broad in terms of complexity and functionality, but it's quite a small audience. So it's not like we're trying to de- develop a, a business to consumer uh, app with a hundred different things on the wish list. We, we, we're quite focused on what the roadmap is and what we're trying to deliver. 
I think as we are now looking to develop something for an external customer, um, that's going to be really different. You know, there's lots and lots of for us to learn, having predominantly focused on either digital products to the general consumer um, and um and internal business applications now is an opportunity to really deliver a product it's a kind of business to business product that's going to we, we'll have to look at how best to do that and i will be speaking to my peer network to, to try and get advice from people who've done that before as well so what do you think though, are the main challenges that face us as technology leaders today i, I think up until now a lot of talk around digital and around uh, digital transformation and actually not really understanding what that is. So getting that alignment on the board, getting that CDO or CIO on the board reporting to the CEO, I think is an absolute crucial first step. That's a that's a real big challenge. Um, the other thing is uh, privacy. Data privacy. Uh, I've been writing uh, and investigating a lot about AI and and um, ethics recently, and we've got to get that right uh, as a, as a, as a, um, as an industry. We've got to get that right. Now we've got to get that right as a as a charity, Anti Nolan, because our entire our entire model is based on trust trust of data records and DNA. But we're you know. We, hopefully we can be trusted to do that well but as an industry i think how we have been so flippant with the use of people's data and uh, taken advantage of that has got to be addressed and the introduction of ai makes that even more um you know supercharges effectively that that misuse of data and, and decision making i think these are the, the, kind of the biggest challenges that we're facing just a break that into two component parts there. I'll, I'll stick with the, the the data piece for the moment, which is interesting because you, you, you mentioned different registers across the world. How do you go about sharing that data with those different stem cell registers across the world, but also keeping the, the, the data privacy, data residency, all those other issues that we've, we've got to deal with? How, how do you balance that? Um, well, it started off as a book that was printed every year of a list of all of the donors around the world that was posted out to all of the registers across the world. Uh, that was a few years ago. Um, and then it evolved to a floppy disk, um, which was a little bit easier to uh, update and distribute. Um, and then an actual you know, database was, was created around 15 years ago, which was a, a accessible online. We're in the process of now putting APIs in place. Um, the data that is held centrally is fully pseudonymized. Or it's pseudonymized. Um, the actual central repository organization cannot identify individuals within there. There are unique uh, identifying codes for every single donor in the world uh, that we have a, a standard for. So it's only once you start engaging uh, as a register directly with a transplant center that you start to identify who the individuals are. Um, and there are very strong data use agreements and, and terms in place on the use or misuse of any of that data. Um, but we're in the process of, of um, implementing a, a API access so that registries, instead of at the moment, uh, Anti Nolan has to do all of its work internally on its own system, then it has to go onto a website to do the international search. Uh, we've been helping build a, a global API so that we can run everything from our own platforms. That's really good. So to, to go to the second part of the question, uh, you also mentioned about the, the importance of having these technology leaders part of the board. So how do you go about communicating that strategic value of technology to, to the rest of the, the, the board members? We, we try and talk about outcomes um, more and we try and talk about technology less. Um, but we also try... And this has been the hardest part. We try and influence. Uh, I suppose if you think if you think in the technology my, uh, technology environment, we are moving from waterfall to agile as a general rule across the board. But in the boardroom, it's still a very waterfall planning, strategy, budgeting cycle, and it's breaking the back of that cycle to allow the opportunity uh, to experiment to um to invest strategically but making sure that it's actually having an impact 
So one of the things that, that we try and do is say, don't, you know, don't have me come here and tell you what's going to happen for the next three years, because I'm going to, I'm going to use those words that you hate, which is, I don't know. And I'm not shy to say, I don't know. And I said that a lot. So they say, well, how much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take? Well, I don't know. But what I do know is that in the next three months, we could experiment with X and then let's look at it after those three months and then make a decision on whether that investment was worthwhile or not and whether we should continue or not and get into a much more dynamic cycle of prioritization and, and growth. That's If you can do that and then start talking about that in terms of the future of the workplace, it means you're not really talking about technology, you're talking about outcomes, you're talking about customer, um, and you are not making up on the hoof. You've got a, you've got a long-term plan, but you're making sure that you're always backing the right horses all the time. Good advice. This is just not always the, the, the industry that you've been in, is it? So you've had a bit of a diverse background to your own career. How did you get to, to the, the position where you are? Because I know you've worked in a number of other organizations, as we said at the start, you know, Marks and Spencer and uh, John Lewis and Kodak and things like that. Anyway, I don't think your, your career has always been in IT either, has it? So yeah. how, how, did, how did it actually all begin for you? It was, well, it began, it began when I was uh, 15 and I was at school uh, and we were about to invest in um, a new computer network. I think there were 486 uh, PCs, 486 uh, um, processors. And for some reason or another, I ended up being involved in the uh, RFP tender process as I'm not sure how as a 15 year old, I did that. And I ended up uh, influencing the school to go against <laughs> their better judgment of the preferred provider and, and go for a different provider um, and really put their supplies on the spot. So I ended up being the kind of computer network manager at school um, and I'm non-technical, so I don't really code and I don't really build servers or anything, but I just kind of have a natural understanding and feeling for how technology could be used and how it can benefit others. And so I then had a decision, what do I do at university? And I thought, well, definitely not technology because I enjoy that far too much. I don't want to go and ruin it by making a career out of it. That's crazy. Um, and so I did a degree in chemical engineering and worked at Kodak as a chemical engineer during my gap placement and realized I don't want to be an engineer. Technology is so much easier and I could probably make a decent living out of it. So I'll just do that and, and landed on my feet at the John Lewis partnership with a great graduate training scheme. So the beauty of it is um, working in a field that every organization on the planet needs. Isn't that great? You don't have to be siloed into a specific business uh, industry. Um, my kind of knowledge and experience and skills, I, and I used to specialize in infrastructure, were, were just that. So I did move from John Lewis to m and And when I left m and I thought, get out of retail because you don't want to be siloed. You know, 20 years in retail, you're not going to be able to, to get out of it again. So I decided I'd go into something different. And in, in terms of um, how I ended up in this role, there were two things happened. One was I'd only really managed about four people up until that point. And I, the best piece of advice I was ever given uh, from a, a guy I kind of call a, a mentor now, he was managing 40 people at the time. I'm like, wow, how on earth? is that even possible? And he goes, well, I'm still only managing about five people, but they're managing the rest of the teams. So it's not really that different. And it just unlocked something in my brain that meant that my next role ended up being a head of technology, uh, running a global team of 40 people uh, within a year, actually. It just unlocked that potential of confidence. Um, and I did that for a few years at the, at the grassroots group in a completely different industry around employee engagement and um, staff incentives and, and recognition programs. And then, and then I decided, right, I'm ready to go into the not-for-profit sector. I want absolute core social purpose in what I do uh, to have an impact. Um, but the challenge was taking on a role, having only ever worked in infrastructure. So again, I had to unlock in my brain the fact that I, I wanted a role that had responsibility for application development, data, and ultimately digital. Um, and I had to convince the uh, the recruitment panel that whilst I hadn't done it, I had the potential to be able to do it, um, which was a challenge. Um, but we, we we got there, and and I got onto that onto this role, and then spent the last five years learning about 
delivering application development, digital data, and, and the works. What a story. <laughs> yeah, quite, 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 quite a journey, isn't it? So I suppose if you were to give you know, someone you know, up and coming uh, sort of what a piece of advice you know, it's maybe similar to the advice that you received but what what would you give them in, in terms of helping their career in technology i think it's uh, it would be really that focus on you will get the technologists that will be you know deep under the covers of, of network configuration and and so on um those types of jobs are fewer and far between now and they're running you know they're helping keep the cloud up and running but i think for the other people it's really about being customer focused understanding um the impact of what you do on a customer and agile gives you some of that devops gives you a lot of that um if you're in a infrastructure or service desk perspective it's all about the customer the heavy lifting is done by by the cloud and the and the, and the big the big players in the market so really understanding the purpose of of what you want to achieve through technology rather than fixating on the technology in its own right is absolutely key and be prepared for it to change when i start an infrastructure you've got your storage teams and your network teams and your environment teams and you just don't need that anymore that everything is converged uh, and most of the things are provided as a service so it's keep your eyes open and watch how the industry is changing I suppose to call out for people in a development environment now is not that I think that low code or no code is going to replace all development, but um, it's certainly going to have an impact. And the skills that the developers have are absolutely crucial to putting in good structure, good governance and good design, even in a no code environment and, uh, and, and really start to fixate on that and the use of data. And, and not go, well, the data is for the data analyst and the developers just focus on the code. So it's 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 keeping keeping your head up and your eyes open, looking at what the customer need, looking at the impact of what you're delivering and the ever-changing landscape and making sure that you continue to stay relevant rather than go, I've learned my trade and that's what I'm going to do until I retire. I think it's one of the things I, I really enjoy about the, the technology community and, and, and the jobs that we do is that they're, they're always changing, they're yeah. ever evolving. And you know, one of the things we have seen in recent years is, is definitely this democratization of, of technology so that uh, it, it's not just the remit of the, of the digital or the technology team anymore. It's, um, it, it can be anyone because of the, the availability of, of those types of services, as you, as you said. And that traditional technology team have got the skills that are needed for the rest of the organization to implement these low technology solutions. So don't don't waste them. Don't get stuck in a rut, but but really blend and collaborate and become become that truly blended team across an organization. Do you see the, um, the the technology role being a lot more focused around the security, the security posture around those solutions as well because of that democratization? You've almost kind of have the right level of control and governance and making sure that the solutions that are being put in place are actually secure ones. Yeah, to a degree, um, I, I would probably err on the side of the word privacy more than security, but, but the, the principle still stands. Yes, 100 percent. You, you've got to make sure that um, everyone remembers that personal data belongs to the data subject and not to the organization and not to their team and not, not to their product. Um, and uh, in, ensuring that things are lined up properly and that you don't, you don't do things in one area then exposes a, a vulnerability or a weakness in another. Absolutely. It's part of that being grown up piece that I was speaking about earlier with a small team. It's have that enterprise quality thinking in everything that you do. Well, Danny, it, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. I think you know we, we could probably go on for a lot, lot longer, but uh, yeah, in the interests of time, I'd just like to thank you very much for taking the time out to talk about you know some of your insights and, and experiences, and I'm sure our audience will, will enjoy it as well. Thank you, Dave, and thank you for the opportunity. Great stuff. Thanks, Danny. In next week's podcast, I'll be talking with David Wilde about his experiences in central and local government. Please subscribe to the podcast and stay tuned for more inspiring tech leaders.